Good evening. So, DPF Library is really happy to welcome you here tonight for this third day of the Open Science Evening Talks. Um, tonight we are going to discover a bit more on uh, research data, open science and researcher engagement in this process. Uh, we will have three international speakers. We are really happy to have them with us tonight. Um, they will have like 15 minutes for a talk, then you, you will have five minutes for questions and answers, and then we'll have an informal aperitif, and you are really warmly um, invited to join us for a discussion with them and with us. I'm going to briefly introduce the three speakers, and then I will add the floor to them for the discussion and for the talk. Um, the first speaker is Marta Teperek. She's a molecular biologist by training, but then she's a professional involved in the open research advocacy. She was before at the University of Cambridge where she led the um, research data ma management facility services, and she uh, initiated the two very important programs there, the Data Champions program and the Open Research Data Pilot. Now she has the technical, she's in the Technical University of Delft where she coordinates the research data stewardship project. The second speaker is Sunia Dalmayer Thyssen. She's at CERN and she's there since 2009 where she started as doctoral student in information science. And now she's data coordinator and together with her team, she uh, built uh, um, services to support researchers in this path towards openness and reproducibility. The last speaker is Lucia Prieto. Uh, she's a neuroscientist, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Lausanne and she will soon move to the Francis Crick Institute in London with uh, her own research group. She's also co-founder of TREND, that is a, a non-profit organization that supports sustainable development through education and scientific innovation in Africa. I think she's going to speak a bit more about that later in the talk. Um, so, uh, uh, I will just let the floor to Marta. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and hopefully get some interesting feedback and questions from you guys. And just a question, can everybody hear me in the back? Can you raise your hand if you can? Okay, good. In case I'm going uh, low voice, just please let me know because I tend to move a lot, so just give me signs. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Lorenza. Uh, my name is Marta Teperek, and I indeed uh, come, I'm now working at TU Delft. Uh, and just wanted to show you that this building in here, somebody asked me, that's actually our library. So the library is like covered with grass, so we try to encourage students and researchers to come and you know, talk with us. That's our trick. And uh, some first things first, just wanted to tell you that all the materials, all the images in this presentation are under CC0 license unless indicated. So if there is nothing said otherwise, then it means that it's CC0 license. You can take them, reuse them, copy however you want. And also the slides uh, for my talk are available. So if you would like to download them, follow the links, or the resources are there, you can just click on that link and you'll be able to reuse them as well. So what will be the structure of this talk? I would like to tell you about a couple of things. The topic of my talk is really researcher engagement, and I would like to demonstrate just two examples of some, let's say, a bit innovative ways of how can we engage research community with research data management. And first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the case study we did in Cambridge. I mean, the case, my experiences at the University of Cambridge when I was developing the data services there. So I will tell you about the dangers of top-down approaches and also about the program of data champions that we introduced to try to tackle these dangers. And secondly, I would like to tell you about, about my work at TU Delft and what we are planning to do there. So that's yet a different way of trying to work with researchers effectively on research data management. And uh, towards the end, hopefully, we'll have some discussions about how to take it going forward. So first, the case study from Cambridge. So the case study was really a case study about how not to do this. So that's probably you know, a hard lesson for me. I, had a, I started very badly. Researcher didn't like what we created for them. So hopefully by sharing this story with you, you will avoid similar mistakes. So what's happening in the, in the landscape, as I'm sure you know, many, many funding bodies, agencies, publishers have not the requirement for data sharing. So in the UK, it's no different. We all have the, so far, we are still eligible for the European Commission funding. Maybe we won't be with Brexit. <coughs> but at the time when I was there, there was all these you know, requirements from the European Commission from Horizon 2020. Researchers now need to 
share their data, open data by default, they have to prepare data management plans. In the UK, it was even more strict. Funders went step further towards the openness and sharing. And one funding body, one of the biggest governmental funder called EPSRC, and the acronym stands for Engineering in Physical Sciences Research Council. And basically, they fund the types of research that you are guys doing at EPFL. They decided, oh yes, we have these policies for greater openness and nobody cares. So let's be more strict. So they said, that every single paper which acknowledges their funding needs to have the research data available and linked to from the paper. So as you can imagine, and they said that they were doing spot checking on researchers, so the research community panicked, but we thought, haha, in that way we have a very easy way to argue for, you know, why you should be doing good data management. So with these arguments in hand, you must be sharing your data because the funders tell you you have no choice. We came to our research community quite content with ourselves. You know, now everybody will be doing it. We'll make a lot of friends. The uh, situation was actually just opposite. And researchers were not so fond on, about our messaging and about doing that. So the reactions were quite different than what we anticipated. So people were saying like, oh, this is not my priority. I'm a researcher. I'm supposed to do research, not to share my data and spend time managing my data. Or people will steal my results if I share them. Other people would say my data is not interesting. So why would I share it if nobody would want to even reuse my data? Or questions like the statements. I can't really share because the person who actually had the data has already left, so there is no data that I can share. Or data management is simply a waste of time. That's not my priority. Why would I do that? Or some other people, it would take me five years to find my data, so there's no way I'm going to spend that time. So we thought, okay, this, our initial approach doesn't seem to be working. Let's perhaps think of a different strategy. And we indeed thought of a different strategy, like looking at the two different approaches, the policeman with a stick or the carrots and rewards. We thought, let's eliminate the policeman. Let's try to think of something nicer we can offer to researchers, think about the incentives. And also the other thing, because we started talking about the really top-down approach, the policy on a national level requiring researchers to do things. We thought, okay, let's try to perhaps also address the approach is more from the bottom up, involving the research community instead of coming with the policy approach. So we did both at the same time. And first, I will just give you a couple of examples of how we completely change our advocacy. At the moment, you know, and that's something we're still doing at TU Delft now, we don't mention the funder requirements until the very end. We really talk about the selfish benefits, about the intrinsic motivations, because we believe that they are much stronger drivers for people to do the right thing. So some examples, you know, questions we can ask to researchers. What if I stole your laptop right now? Would you lose any data? How much data would you lose? And you know, you would be surprised, like, I don't know, pro probably it's much better at EPFL as it seems like today the students at the workshop are really backing up their data. But most of the time people will say, oh, you know, oh, what happens? And they start to think about the practice of data management or showing them examples that are relevant to the community. You know, for all the researchers working in the lab, you know, when they see this graph with some handwritten notes, they start laughing because they sympathize with that. Yes, they are doing similar things. And of course, at the end, the graph would nicely end up in the bin and, oh, where is my data? Where are my notes? So just showing them examples that they would be familiar with. Or other things, like that, you know, and this actually comes from TU Delft, and that's during my first week of interaction with researchers. One guy who said he's very good with data management, I just managed to capture his wonderful screenshot. He agreed, fortunately, for me to use it for advocacy materials, but, you know, just making sure that people understand that for their own benefits, it's beneficial if they do something about data management. And other examples, file naming convention, you know, <laughs> who did not have problems with file naming and made some funny final number two, or hopefully not the latter one in there, but usually people ex accuse, ex you do, you know, people laugh because they really see themselves in these examples. So these are the selfish benefits. And what about sharing? How do we convince researchers about sharing? And I have to say here that when the policy the, from the EPSRC, you know, the funding body, you must share because I will check that you must be sharing your data, that actually worked in a way that researchers, yes, indeed, they deposit some data in the repository, 
But don't quote me on this, 90% of these data sets, they were just rubbish, you know? They were like PDF, yes, this is my supporting data with a screenshot of an image, you know, from raw data. It was completely useless. We couldn't refuse these data sets, but that was not the point. The point is really how it benefits you as a researcher. And again, we can ask questions like, you know, who published the paper? Probably many people in here. And, you know, asking the question, what if somebody approached you and asked you for the raw data supporting your publication? And we had a discussion, like, again, during my first weeks at TU Delft, I've asked one researcher who was very negative about the data sharing approach. I've asked him, so have you ever been asked for the data? Oh, yes, this annoying person asked me for the raw data supporting my paper. So what did you do then? Oh, it was horrible. It took me a couple of days to find the data because I wasn't sure which file supported that paper, which version it was. And, you know, so I have asked him, at the time of writing your paper, did you know it? Would it be easy if you just shared your data in the repository? Ah, oh, yes, you know, and next time, that ki that's how you convert people. When they think about their own selfish benefits, burden relief, they start to be convinced. And you know, similarly, you know, what if I ask you the same question five years later? I guess it would be even tougher, or 10 years later. So just, again, thinking about the selfish benefits, the selfish drivers. And these are just a couple of examples. And at the same time, I promised that I would tell you about some bottom-up initiatives. So we wanted to, you know, get away of these top-down policy approaches. And we thought, how about we empower researchers? And how about we engage researchers in the process of data management? How about we invite researchers to work with us? So we started a program uh, called the Data Champions, where maybe you actually recognize one of those speakers, Laurent. He was actually one of our first data champions. We invited researchers who were interested in data management, in open science, to join us as our data champions. And what we asked them in return, so they had their profiles, as you see, they get publicity, we created communi community for them, some recognition. And in return, we <coughs> asked them to help us to, ask, uh, to act as local advocates within their departments, within their disciplines, to talk about data management and to do some training on data management. So what happened with this? The original tasks that we ask our champions to do, and again, I want to stress that these were just volunteers, we asked them to deliver training on data management on our behalf to their own communities in a disciplinary manner. What they did instead was everything else that we asked them for. So, you know, we've got numerous of various outputs, like workshops, you know, how do you use GitHub for version control? Or weekly data management tip emails training needs analysis for the department. Another one came up with the idea of embedding data management within their training program. So that was one of the lecturers at engineering. One person developed FAQs for chemists. So just to show you some screenshots, these are the weekly tip emails that the researcher was sending to everybody in the department. Hey guys, you know, maybe let's do something about file naming. These are the frequently asked questions about open data. Again, discipline specific for chemists. So they did a lot of good stuff. But, you know, when you step outside, and I think I, I'm in a lucky position because I left, so I was able to step outside and think about, you know, what worked, what didn't work. We had a discussion uh, before uh, I moved to TU Delft. What really worked about these approaches and what didn't, when you look at advantages and disadvantages of the two different ways of approaching the problem. So I guess the biggest advantage of this top-down approach, it's really fast, so you quickly deliver your message, and it's very cost-effective. The disadvantage of the top-down approach is that you risk, really, that your solutions will be misaligned and the community will disengage. When you think about the bottom-up approaches, the community really engage. You can have innovative solutions and uh, it's very rewarding and I can never underestimate this. In terms of the disadvantages, it's extremely time-consuming. You know, when you try to manage a bunch of volunteers from across a huge university, with different backgrounds, different disciplinary needs, different time availability, that becomes like a full-time job. So that's something to consider. And also their time, you know, if they are volunteers, their job is to do research. So we have to be respectful of what they're doing. And there was no framework, no longer term recognition. You see what they delivered, everything was different. So we have to think about how do we bring it all together. So just to tell you in uh, like one minute, what are we doing at TU Delft? What is the different approach? Uh, so, Delft, if you haven't heard, it's actually Technical University of Technology. So, and similarly to what you're doing at EPFL, 
it has a very strong focus on open science. So the rector at TU Delft really recognizes that open science is the future. And moreover, what they said that research data management is a necessary prerequisite for any openness and sharing. If you don't manage your data well, you can't share anything because you can't even find your files. So what are we talking about? We have to take the first step first. So what we did indeed in Delft, we have a data stewardship program which has a goal of really changing the day-to-day -day practice of data management and improving this systematically across the university. And the key to this, we thought, is to make sure that the practices and policies are discipline specific. So really understanding what the researchers need. You don't create a policy which is obscure and to be ignored by people. You want to create policies and workflows which are embraced by your community and understood by your communities. So what we have at each of the eight faculties at Delft, we have our superheroes, data stewards, who are appointed with the dedication, it's in their job description, to actually change data management practices at their faculties. They are disciplinary experts, so they had training, at least a PhD degree in the discipline related to the faculty's research, and they also receive intense training on data management. So the goal is to embed them within the faculty and really have create them as the go-to people that will have the trust with the research community, understanding and the knowledge to really support them well. And that's centrally led by the data stewardship coordinator, who is me, so I'm very lucky and I have interesting project, I think. And uh, just to finish uh, off, and that's my real last slide, is that we also had the question about, you know, some faculties <coughs> raised the question, oh, but maybe one data steward is not enough. We have so many diverse types of research. We need more data stewards. But of course, that it becomes quite costly. It would be nice to have it, but you know, how can we afford to have more data stewards? And would one data steward successfully engage with everyone? So just our plans. We are thinking now, and that hasn't yet been started, I can tell you, maybe in half a year if it took off the ground and whether it works. We are thinking about pairing data stewards with local data champions who will be the volunteer researchers, but because there will be a small group easy to tackle, perhaps this could work and perhaps there could be a nice team of people that can support each other. So that's the end from me. Before I go, I just wanted to tell you these are two examples that I shared. Of course, each university, each institution would have their own examples of how they tackle these issues and how they engage with researchers. So I just wanted to invite you for an event that we are doing on the 15th of November at the University of Cambridge where we will be exploring these issues further. And it will not be just me talking about what I've experienced, what I've learned, what not to do, but many people from various countries around Europe, around the world, who will be ch exchanging their experiences. So if you are interested, you are cordially invited to attend and we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Marta. Uh, any question? Uh, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. That's one of the things also that we didn't really do in Cambridge, but in a way it was intentional, not intentional. Because we had volunteers, we couldn't really have like the experience and what the volunteers did in different departments was different. So in a way, we couldn't use the same benchmarking strategy. But at TU Delft, with the data stewards who will be appointed to do the dedicated job, that's exactly the first thing we are doing, so that's a very good question. We want to develop benchmarking strategy, and I'm pleased to say that actually the team at EPFL are working with us to develop some nice survey on research data <coughs> management that we can you know, do at the beginning of data stewards activity, and then see, we run the survey one year later and see did the data management practice improve. For example, do more people do backup of their data? So that's a very, very good point. I really thank you for the question. Okay, my, my question is, um, you've shown that uh, you could apply this bottom-up approach of data stewardship, data champions in a single organization, but funders like the European Commission, they fund consortium, mm -hmm. a consortium of like, it could be tens of, of organizations. How would you approach um, bottom-up data management or any other approach uh, w with a consortium? I mean, I would hope that 
the members of this consortia would be researchers at some institutions, no? So ideally they would have received the training and good education within their institutions. So hopefully they would agree, you know, which institution would take the overall responsibility of data management. <coughs> In terms of taking it more globally, there are also some initiatives that I have not mentioned, but for example, Spark Europe, which is an organization to promote openness in general, also research data management, open data sharing. They have open data champions, which is like a pan-European initiative, and they try to promote people who are doing the right thing. So I guess there are some activities already, you know, internationally that try to showcase these, let's say, best champions of the local universities and try to show, use them, you know, as a nice examples for the others to inspire. But, you know, hopefully with time, also each project, each bigger project, and as proposed by the <coughs> European Commission, would have this 5% of money in each grant application allocated for data management, and hopefully they will have their data stewards dedicated for the project. So that's the wishful thinking perhaps at the moment, but I really hope that will be the future. One last question. <laughs> <laughs> Three last questions. Um, yeah, Marta, thank you very much for this um, um, very um, good hands-on talk. Um, I was wondering if you also have um, impressions or even numbers on um, how many of the, the people you talked to actually used um, um, data from other researchers because most of the time when I mm -hmm. hear about data sharing and, and, and data reuse, then it's um, either institutional services or um, big machines um, yeah. um, from which the data comes from, but I um, rarely um, see people using data from other people, or at least that's my um, um, impression. Perhaps you can prove me otherwise. Uh, we didn't do like a general survey on that. There are some surveys available which were done publicly, for example, by the Wellcome Trust and the Springer Nature, I think, did a similar survey, so I can try to look up the resources and send you them. Uh, we have not been asking our researchers these questions, but from my discussions with researchers and what I understood, that's really discipline specific. Some disciplines like life sciences, they're extremely good at this, and when you ask researchers, you know, do you share? Of course I do, because everybody shares in my discipline. So that's something, I guess, that you are right, you know, there will be some disciplines which wouldn't be doing that so commonly, and we just tell them, you know, look, there are these repositories where you can look for data. <laughs> they are usually very interested because nobody told them, you know, their supervisors didn't know about repositories or that data might be available there. But when you show to researchers, you know, at the early, like when we have workshops to PhD students, that's something that we mentioned. Did we already explore, you know, existing data sets? Could you, for example, compare your results to something that already is there? They're quite interested, and of course, that's disciplinary specific, you know, like let's say material science would, I guess, have difficulty with engaging with this. But yes, I think there is hope, and there are many disciplines which are leading the field. Do I, did I answer your question? I will talk later. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question. Yes. So thank you very much for this inspiring talk. So. I ask just one question, if you want, having passed some time in industry, the more I heard about open science and what you presented in particular tonight, is that uh, it reminds me a lot about good laboratory practice. Mm -hmm. Would you make some comments on the difference mm -hmm. of what you, you call open science and this question of mm -hmm. how to save data and mm -hmm. good laboratory practice? That's a, that's a very good question, and thank you for this. I actually very like the question. And that's again, perhaps, you know, a lot of harm, at least I personally think so, and people can dispute this, and I might sound controversial because it's indeed open science evening talks. But I think personally that a lot of harm was done by using the name open data for data because, and exactly as you mentioned, like for many collaborations with the industry or for many data sets which elements of privacy, you can't just simply throw your data to the open because it will be harmful for many different stakeholders. So, and especially, you know, I guess there was this bad connotation with open access, you know, let's just make the PDF of the paper open access and people thought, eh, we can just make open data, it's the same, you know, it's easy. That's not easy. Data has got its own difficulties. There are various considerations that have to be taken into account. What I really like, people are now trying not to use open data and they try to replace it with fair data, which means something different, you know. Okay, I'm doing research which is, for example, shared between a commercial partner and the public institutions. How do you manage the conflict of interest? And I think the, the really important thing, and perhaps you will talk about this later because you mentioned this today during the, the, the morning session, 
that sometimes, you know, just being able to know that a data set exists, what are the conditions for access? For example, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement with this company, but at least knowing that a data set already exists is something, you know, is a step forward. So I think we shouldn't necessarily make it making everything open. I think it would be quite harmful for the society, for many researchers. It's more about making it fair, making it discoverable, making it accessible under certain circumstances and conditions. That will be my answer to that. Oh, no, I'm 